Good morning, everyone. 464 days ago, on March 7th, I was at a Norwich hockey game when I learned we had our first case of COVID-19 in Vermont. I got up from my seat and headed into the office ready to take on this challenge. We had spent weeks leading up to that moment learning everything we could about this new virus and preparing for what seemed to be the inevitable. A day later, we stood at the Emergency Operations Center to announce that the global pandemic had reached our doorstep. Since then, we've had 145 briefings, many with difficult news and hard choices, others offering reason for hope and confidence in brighter days ahead, and always telling you what we knew, what we didn't know, what actions we were taking, and why. There's no doubt each of us, every single Vermonter, has been through a lot over the last 15 months. Missing time with family and friends, adapting to restrictions, putting off weddings, birthday parties, holidays and travel, working and learning from home, or worse, losing loved ones, businesses, or jobs. For 15 months, our daily lives have been impacted by a global, once in a century crisis that required us to do things we never thought we'd have to do. Never did I think I'd be the governor ordering businesses to close, sending kids home from school, or telling people to stay home, to stay safe. I think back to the early days, calling the vice president because we didn't think we had enough test kits to get us through the week, chasing a lead from Congressman Welch and cold calling someone I'd never met at 10 o'clock on a Friday night in hopes of getting enough PPE for our healthcare workers. There was also a time when, based on what we'd seen in other states, we thought we were going to need refrigerated trailers because hospital morgues might not be able to handle what was coming. Although we faced heartbreaking losses, we're fortunate these types of measures weren't needed. And it was only because of the unity of the people of Vermont, whose commitment to neighbors and community never wavered. At the beginning, I told you we would face, find, and fight this virus together. That's exactly what Vermonters have done and continue to do. And you've done it better than any other place in the country. I also believe that we've done it as well as or better than any other place in the world. Together, we built a nation-leading response that kept people safe. Vermont has had among the highest testing and lowest hospitalizations in the country. We've had the fewest deaths and cases per capita in the continental US. And keep in mind, this is even after we ended stay home, stay safe, and restarted our economy to put people back to work and kids back in school. Alongside the legislature, and with the strong support of the congressional delegation, we also work to protect those who were hit hardest, providing financial help for individuals, small businesses, laid off workers, and so many more. We've also built a vaccination program that Vermonters have, had, have made the very best there is without offering financial incentives other than the occasional maple creamy. Which brings me to why we're here this morning. Today, I'm very proud to announce that Vermont has now become the first state in the nation to vaccinate 80% of its 12 and over population. In a fair comparison to President Biden's goal of 70% of Americans over the age of 18 by July 4th, Vermont has vaccinated 81.8% of 18 plus. We said 
from the very start in the face of criticism that our vaccine strategy would prove to be the most effective in the nation. That in order to protect the most vulnerable, a simple to understand and easy to implement age banding strategy would deliver the best results. Again, not only did we lead the United States, but Vermont is now a global leader in vaccinations to defeat COVID-19. Our state has shown the world what's possible when you have a group of people with the right attitude, following the data, and trusting medical science. Now, here's the news many have been waiting to hear and I've been waiting to deliver for 15 months. Now that we hit 80%, as promised, effective immediately, I'm lifting all remaining state pandemic restrictions and state of emergency will formally end at midnight, June 15th, tomorrow. And here's why, because it's safe to do so. And it's safe because Vermonters have done their part to keep the virus from spreading and stepping up to get vaccinated. In fact, no state in the nation is in a better position to do this than we are. So to be clear, here's what this change means, and it's really very simple. There are no longer any state COVID-19 restrictions, none. So unless there's a federal requirement in place, like for public transportation or long-term care facilities, employers, municipalities and individuals can operate under the same conditions as before the pandemic. I know most Vermonters have been anxiously awaiting this moment, but I also know there are some who might feel uncomfortable, who have their own legitimate reasons to remain cautious. And as I've said, that's natural and it's okay. I hope all Vermonters show compassion and respect for one another, including businesses choosing to keep some requirements in place while they wait for all their employees to do the right thing and get vaccinated. But I want everyone to understand, we're able to remove restrictions because there's no longer needed to prevent the surge in COVID hospitalizations or deaths we've been concerned about. And like every decision, Throughout this pandemic, it was made with support of our top public health experts, Dr. Levine and Dr. Kelso. It's important to note that even as we celebrate this milestone, our work isn't done. We'll continue to vaccinate as many Vermonters as we can because every shot given today, tomorrow, and in the weeks to come is just as important as the ones we administered yesterday. And when vaccines are approved for younger Vermonters in the months ahead, we'll be ready. Vermont's success has been a team effort across the state. Each one of us knows people who have gone above and beyond. This list is long, so I'm reluctant to share individual thanks for fear of missing too many but I do want to mention some, starting with the incredible work of our frontline teams, from contact tracers to the EPI team, state emergency operations center staff, everyone on our HOC, SEOC crew, and all those who had to turn their full-time attention to the response. Over the past 15 months, I've been briefed 236 times by the Joint SEOC and Health Operations Center, which includes hundreds of people from across the state. The Vermont National Guard has also been there for us, whether it's vaccinations, food distribution, building and maintaining medical surge sites, or anything we've asked for of them. They've been there ready, willing, and able. And on the vaccine front, the Guard was joined by so many partners across the state, including 
EMS crews, hospitals and other providers, pharmacies, schools, businesses, community groups, and more. I also want to thank our legislature and the congressional delegation for their support. Without Senator Leahy, Senator Sanders, and Congressman Welch, we wouldn't have had the resources we needed and will need for the recovery to come. Here in the room today behind me, we have some of the members of my COVID-19 leadership response team. None of our success would have been possible without them. From the very beginning, this has been all hands on deck. And we've broken down silos and gotten creative. For example, when I appointed Mike Pichek as Commissioner of Financial Regulation back in 2017, I don't think he was expecting to develop modeling for a global pandemic. But he and his team at DFR have done remarkable work. And then there's our restart teams, Secretary Curley, Mr. Sherling, Secretary Moore, Secretary French, and all the volunteer business, community, and education partners who help guide our reopening efforts. Our seasoned leaders at AHS, Secretary Smith, Deputy Secretary Samuelson, and their entire team, and Secretary Young at the Agency of Administration. But the list goes on and on, from digital services to VTRANS and public service, to labor and ag, BGS, tax and libraries, every single agency and department has had a role to play. The staff in my office have also quietly, but effectively helped to keep people informed and field, fielded all their requests for help. They've been essential to keeping all this together and our team focused and accountable, as well as my cabinet and their teams who kept state government fully operational, even while they took on the additional responsibilities of this pandemic. And then of course, there's Dr. Levine and our state epidemiologists, Dr. Kelso and their teams, whose advice and guidance were relied on from the very start, whose thoughtfulness, hard work and dedication are like none I've ever seen. I know we don't intentionally take people for granted, but I have to say, Vermonters are fortunate to have all these public servants leading this response. And as governor, I'm very blessed to have a team with so much character, commitment, competence, and chemistry. Fate can have a funny way of putting the right people in the right place at the right time, and I think that's exactly what happened here. I also want to thank you, the members of the press, the broadcasters who carry this, these briefings live, all the journalists from across the state who've called in. You've kept Vermonters informed, and you held our feet to the fire. We don't always love your questions, but we're not supposed to. Your focus on transparency and accountability had made our response better, and Vermonters are better for it. But at the end of the day, <clears throat> the people who deserve the credit most are everyday Vermonters, those who wake up each morning wanting to do the right thing. Vermonters met this difficult moment from the very start. You cared for one another. You followed the science and you put others first. You stuck together even while you had to be physically separated. We've been united in our commitment, our sense of duty and our care and respect for one another. The ingenuity creativity and dedication of all Vermonters to their friends and families, to their neighbors and to their communities has been incredible. And we should all be
be very proud. I know I am. Through it all, we've shown the nation and much of the world how to respond when there's no playbook and how to do it with civility and respect. But this is no surprise to me and should be no surprise to anyone who knows anything about what it means to be a Vermonter. On the first day of the battle in Gettysburg, General Sedgwick knew enough about our character and courage to send the order. Put the Vermonters ahead. 157 years later, we've shown when the nation is in need of leadership and hope, when America needs to find its path forward to solve problems and help people, when in dark times our country needs a state to light the way, Vermonters will always step forward and lead the charge. I thank all of you for what you've done over the last year and a half and the work we'll do together to recover stronger than ever before. And we still have a lot of work to do. So let's keep moving Vermont forward. With that, I'll turn it over to a familiar face. Thank you, Governor. I'll keep my remarks fairly brief this morning. As we mark this significant milestone today, allow me to start off by saying thank you, sincerely. While this global pandemic is not over, and there are many in the U.S. and around the world still at risk of harm that this virus can cause, we can all take pride in what this milestone means. Vermont stands once again among the healthiest of states in America. This is a statewide achievement and says much about the individual and policy commitment Vermont has to public health. Fortunately for me, the governor took the almost impossible task of trying to thank everyone that could possibly be thanked for getting us to where we are today. This allows me the luxury of focusing in on just a few thank yous. I'd like to start by singling out our public health staff for recognition, about three quarters of whom have been deployed to COVID-19 work for many months now. And I extend my personal gratitude as well to those at the department who are not directly part of the response. You have been and continue to be consummate professionals, critical to making sure our other essential public health functions were still going strong. I've seen nothing short of complete dedication by every member of the health department. No matter what their role, these public servants approached each challenge with thoughtfulness, care, compassion, and expertise. You are my public health heroes. Along with my comrade throughout this entire enterprise, Dr. Kelso. I want to also thank our many partners, all of whom continue to be instrumental in this very successful vaccination effort. The governor has already named many, but I especially want to give a shout out to the organizations that have helped us break down barriers to getting vaccinated. Whether it be language, cultural, accessibility, transportation, historical mistrust, and so much more. But most of all, I want to thank Vermonters. We have asked so much of you throughout this pandemic from staying home to following many restrictions. We've asked you to learn about how to prevent the spread of a virus new to humanity, to assess risks and to protect yourselves. And ultimately, 
We asked you to trust in a new vaccine based on data and science, and you again rose to that challenge. Not to mention the trust you placed in us to build and implement Vermont's data-driven and scientifically credible approach. That trust continues to drive me and all of us in our work to protect and promote the health of all Vermonters. It is truly the public and public health that matters. We could not have done any of this alone. Together, we've now attained a high level of protection in Vermont, and that is no small feat. Our high vaccination rates will help keep coronavirus activity at historically low levels. This means fewer chances for COVID to spread between people and throughout our communities. Fewer, if any, hospitalizations, and importantly, prevent any more loss of life from the virus. It also means less opportunity for mutations and more virulent strains from developing. This protection is what is allowing us to lift restrictions today. That is public health at work. But of course, it is my job to tell you that the work is far from over. We will continue getting as many Vermonters vaccinated as possible to keep this protection as strong as we can. We will continue to keep watching our data closely and act accordingly. We will still offer plenty of opportunities to get vaccinated and guidance for people who are not yet vaccinated to protect themselves and those around them. There is still a lot at stake for many Vermonters, especially those who cannot be vaccinated. This is a responsibility we will all continue to share to protect them from this virus, from symptoms that can last for months or the more chronic long COVID syndrome or the rare inflammatory syndrome in children. For those who can't get vaccinated, we will do our best to keep you healthy. And to anyone who has chosen to not get vaccinated, I ask you once again to reconsider for your health and those you love. Once federal officials determine it's safe for use, possibly as soon as this fall, we will prepare for the approval of the vaccine to be used in younger children. I'm already collaborating with my pediatric colleagues so that we will be ready to get parents and caregivers the information they need and to deliver the vaccine in as many appropriate settings as possible and with the supports you need. This pandemic has been the strongest reminder in nearly a century of the power vaccines have in controlling infectious diseases. This is why we call them vaccine preventable diseases. Vaccines save lives. They keep us healthy and they keep our communities healthy. So please remember, public health is still here and we still need you, my fellow Vermonters, to keep COVID-19 vaccination a top priority. Thank you again for all of your sacrifices and all of you have done and will continue to do. Now I'll open up to questions. And we will start in the room with Calvin Cutler. Just to remind folks, we have a hard stop, so we're going to get to as many questions as possible. We ask that people please limit to one. I know there were some audio problems for some on the phone, so we're going the old-fashioned way. I've got my cell phone on top of the table, on speakerphone right in front, so we should be able to hear you. Uh, and we'll start with Calvin Cutler. Um, thank you, Governor. So, as mentioned, the state of emergency is going to expire tomorrow, but we're told that you're going to likely sign a new executive order that will maintain some of this FEMA funding. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what that will look like and what it will do. We'll, uh, we'll talk about this in greater detail tomorrow, uh, but we're going to, I'm going to issue an executive order. Now, you know, the state of emergency will be over. Executive order uh, to fill the gaps, you know, some of the feeding programs and so forth that we have in place uh, that we want to continue. Uh, there's also a, a gap uh, with the uh, to-go drinks uh, of two weeks, so we have to uh, make sure that we, we cover that. Uh, so there's some, you know, a few details that we just need to do with the executive order. Devin Bates, Local 22, Local 44. 
Um, yes, yeah, Governor Scott, I believe it was during the press conference in March 2020 when you announced the state of emergency, you were kind of drawing some parallels to the 1918 Spanish flu, how Vermont initially responded to that. My question is, looking 100 years into the future, what advice would you give the governor of Vermont at that time who is suddenly dealing with a global pandemic? Yeah. Uh, the advice I would give is trust the science, trust the data, trust your people, put a good team together, and always tell the truth, uh, even when it's not good news. Uh, just always tell the truth um, so that uh, it builds uh, that trust that you need in order to be successful. And I think that that's what we've done, this team, has done with their teams um, is to build the trust of Vermonters for the most part and so that they've done the right thing as a result. So I would just say again, trust the, the science, the data, and trust the experts. Zuri Hoffman, NBC5. Hi, Governor. For everyday Vermonters, what is the most significant change that will happen for them once the state of emergency expires tomorrow? Uh, really, the most significant uh, change is just going back to normal. Just think back uh, 16 months ago, pre-pandemic, and all the things you could do and all the things you didn't have to worry about, and that's what we're going back to. Um, obviously, um, this is, uh, takes self-responsibility, and there will be some people, as I mentioned in my remarks, that might not be comfortable uh, taking off their masks. There may be some businesses that want to continue. And we just have to be tolerant and we have to be, use our compassion uh, and, uh, and accept that uh, everyone is at a different stage. And so, um, but it means, means really going back to normal. Thank you. Wilson Ring, the Associated Press. Um, hi, it's nice to be here in person for the first time. Good to see you. Who knows how long. Um, the idea of vaccine passports, I know there's a lot of different names on that. Are, are you going to be okay if businesses and say sporting events and nightclubs and so on want to require vaccinations from people who go in? Yeah, I think everyone, uh, all the businesses have to make their own decisions on what they do. Um, but we have proven here in Vermont uh, when we, you know, 80% of, the, of, of those uh, eligible are receiving vaccinations. It's a huge milestone. Again. I know, I know um, there are a couple of states, uh, Hawaii being one, uh, and Massachusetts might be uh, um, in the 70s, um, but we may be one of the only states uh, that accomplishes this. And we're not done. You know, we're going to keep moving forward. You'll find out tomorrow we'll have other vaccination plans open uh, for this, week, this weekend, uh, vaccination sites, uh, so that we can continue. Uh, to vaccinate more Vermonters because every, as I said before, every Vermonter we, we vaccinate in the future um, just protects us more in, in, in what we, we know may be just a, uh, um, like a common flu or something that is not going away at this so, point. So. so if somebody, like an organization or something, wants to require proof of vaccination for entry, are you okay with that? Yeah, I mean, we don't... I would recommend uh, that you can go back to what you had before, um, pre-pandemic, uh, but, um, but this is something that uh, the businesses uh, and enterprises have to decide for themselves. So I'm okay with it. Greg Lamoureux, the County Courier. Governor, you said uh, when you set the 80% goal, uh, you said that you would lift the restrictions that day that we, we hit the 80%. We hit it yesterday. You announced the press conference late, late last night. Uh, you've made the announcement today that, and if I understand it correctly, this is gonna take effect midnight tomorrow night. Um, can you just clarify, yeah. you know, maybe there's a logistic issue as to why it wouldn't take effect literally immediately. Yeah, a, a, a couple of things, Greg. Uh, this is immediate in terms of the restrictions are all lifted right now. That's I've already uh, signed that order um, and and, uh, and tasked uh, the secretary of uh, the agency of community uh, community development uh, to uh, to lifting all the restrictions. So that's that's over. Uh, in terms of the the uh, state of emergency uh, expires tomorrow night. It's just easier just to let it expire. Uh, if I, I guess I could have called a press conference last night at 11 o'clock. Uh, but I'm not sure that anyone would have heard it, and I'm not sure that any of you would have wanted to go, um, but I could have done it last night. But here's a couple of things. Uh, we went in every day. Uh, we didn't know 
when it was going to happen. It wasn't a question of if it was going to happen, it was a question of which day. So Friday, uh, when uh, we received the results, I was thinking it could be Saturday, but we got the results on Friday and there was a little glitch in the CDC um, uh, data and uh, they needed some more time to, to figure it out, but they had us only vaccinating uh, 20, I think it was 28 people on Friday which we knew wasn't correct because we, at one site alone, we had uh, that amount. So um, we knew that it was more than that and they took some time uh, to rectify that uh, during the next day. And then we received the uh, last, or Saturday night, uh, received uh, updated numbers and we were within 300 and something at that point. Um, so last night, you know, being the cautious person I am, you know, trust and verify. Uh, so we received the information and I just wanted to be absolutely sure uh, that we had hit the 80%. So uh, we just took the extra few hours. Um, and again, I know I said that we would lift it that day, but it was, uh, we, I really didn't receive any notice of this until about nine o'clock last night. So we put out the, um, we put out the press uh, um, media uh, briefing uh, timeline for the next day, today, right now. And uh, I just thought it was the prudent thing to do, just to make sure, absolutely sure, uh, that we had the correct information. Peter Hirschfeld, VPR. Governor, we look forward to the details um, about the executive order you'll be signing tomorrow. Um, there's enormous anxiety right now. So, yeah. Human services organizations, public safety officials um, about motel housing and uh, the GA criteria of changing. Can you tell us right now whether or not you're going to postpone institution of the new eligibility criteria, or will folks who don't meet that criteria have to be out on June 30th? Unfortunately, Peter, um, because of our high tech technology here, I didn't get all that. Um, could you? repeat the question and maybe just a little bit louder. Yep, yep. Uh, wondering if uh, you're planning to postpone the change in eligibility criteria for emergency housing for the long-term stays in motels, um, or if folks who don't meet the new criteria will have to be out on June 30th, as, as has been the case up until now. Yeah, there's, there's some, um, we are, you know, some of this, uh, the, the executive order that I'll be signing tomorrow, and we'll go into more detail tomorrow and have updates for you, um, but it's preventing any cliffs from happening. So um, just rest assured, uh, nothing is going to happen abnormally. Uh, as of uh, tomorrow night, we will, um, we will have a, a gradual uh, slope uh, away from the state of emergency for those who are impacted by, in terms of housing and, uh, and feeding programs. So. Um, we'll have more details tomorrow. Thank you. Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. And just a reminder to folks, please speak as loudly as you possibly can. Uh, hi, Governor. First of all, congratulations to you and the administration on all this. I think we all appreciate it across the state. And I'm, just to be clear, uh, an employee, an employer can still require its employees to wear a mask can they also still require customers to wear a mask yeah i'd, I'd equate it to the uh, no shirts uh, no shoes no service it's the same thing so yes um i i, I didn't quite catch that on this <laughs> communications device <laughs> sorry about that uh, tim i'll speak louder um so I, I'd equate it uh, in the same way that we do when there's a sign posted on a business that says no shirts, no shoes, no service. So yes, uh, they'll be able to implement their own guidelines. Okay, great, thank you very much. Lisa Loomis, The Valley Reporter. Lisa Loomis. All right, we will move to Mike Donahue, the Islander. Thank you, Jason, uh, Governor, uh, and I echo what Tim McQuiston said. Uh, thank you for your work and your team. <clears throat> Vermont has 
90 miles of border with Canada with 15 entry points that are critical to the economy. I mean, now that you've hit the 80 percent, is there anything you and the other 12 governors of border in states that border uh, Canada can do to get the border reopened and anything new on sharing vaccines now that the U.S. is apparently going to be sharing those with other countries? Uh, is there any way that uh, Canada can uh, be at the front of your line for any extra vaccines? Yeah, as you know, Mike, we uh, we did... We did send a letter uh, to the White House. We haven't received a response at this point in time. Obviously, they probably want to do it federally, uh, but we wanted to offer any uh, excess uh, uh, vaccine amounts that we have uh, in inventory and, and have coming to us um, for our friends to the north. Um, but uh, but uh, there is some good news, and, and tomorrow you'll see in the modeling update, uh, Commissioner Pichak will go over this. Uh, but. Uh, but Canada has done a tremendous job over the last month and uh, really is uh, leading uh, the, the, the world, I think, in the number of uh, first doses of vaccines. Um, so I have a feeling, uh, obviously, we've heard some good news uh, from the prime minister, but I have a feeling that they will be um, opening up the border uh, fairly soon. Um, but we have to remember, I mean, I, I, I think that they are uh, cautious as well. And it's not just about uh, Vermont. I mean, they would trust if it could just let Vermonters over or those from New Hampshire or Massachusetts or any of the Northeast states. Um, but there are other states uh, in, in the country uh, that haven't uh, accomplished what we have. And so uh, when, once you open the border, it means the border is open uh, to anyone. Um, so. I think they're a little cautious in that respect, uh, but we'll see. This is something we'll continue to advocate for. Uh, we feel that it's safe uh, for us to do so, uh, for uh, having back and forth uh, type of uh, travel. But, um, but obviously this is a decision that President Biden and uh, Prime Minister uh, Trudeau will have to make together. Great, thank you very much, appreciate your time. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Uh, Governor, forgive me if I missed this uh, through the technical issues that we've had, but there's been some speculation I've seen in some press, but have you made a definitive decision about if you're going to continue with press conferences and if so, what that frequency might be? Well, we'll continue, yes, we'll continue with uh, press conferences, press briefings um, starting tomorrow. Uh, so we'll continue uh, on that path, and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll do it weekly. Um, so at this point in time, it'll be the uh, same time, Tuesdays at 11 o'clock, uh, for the foreseeable future. I appreciate uh, the time you've given us all from you and your administration, and congratulations. Well, thank you. Aaron Patenko, Vermont Digger. Just as we announced this, um, asking, you know, what are the rules around children and what are the recommendations for children at this point in time? You know, obviously they are the last population that is broadly unvaccinated. Um, do they have any, are there any mask restrictions for them or are there, are there any mask recommendations that you would have for children specifically at this point? Yeah, all restrictions are lifted at this point. Um, and uh, I think it's uh, going to be up for, for parents, families, uh, to make decisions about their kids. But I might uh, ask Dr. Levine to comment further. The governor is correct. There are, there are no absolute restrictions, but it is recommended that those who are unvaccinated, which would include this group of children, um, be masked when possible in the indoor environment, as opposed to no need for masking outdoors. Avery Powell, WCAX. And just piggybacking off of that question, what, what does this change for schools? I'll let uh, Secretary French answer that. 
Yeah, hi. Um, no change in terms of uh, the guidance we had put out previously that said that they should uh, seek to follow our uh, safe and healthy school year guidance for the remaining part of the school year, which is for the most part ending this week. Um, and to echo Dr. Levine's uh, broader recommendation that if they're inside and unvaccinated, they should wear masks. Liam Elder Connors, VPR. Um, just wondering about if you're going to maintain the high level of uh, testing that's been going on just to try to keep an eye on potential mutations and uh, the variants of the virus that show up. Yeah, we'll continue with a vigorous testing. Uh, protocol will continue to offer that uh, along with we're, we're talking we'll probably have more information on this uh, in the coming days and and uh, weeks but um, we're contemplating trying to merge some of the testing facilities with uh, vaccination sites so that we can offer both thank you Colin Flanders seven days Hi, yeah. Um, Governor, I was just curious, if, upon learning this news last night, was there any um, sort of reaction, celebration? Have you cracked open any champagne <laughs> bottles? Um, I don't really have any other great questions, so it might have worked with that one. <laughs> yeah, no, no champagne, um, not even a beer. Uh, but. Uh, We'll, uh, we'll have plenty of time for that. Uh, we still have a lot of work to do and, and want to make sure that we communicate this in the proper way and uh, savor the moment. Uh, but, uh, but at the same time, know that you know, our world is still um, under siege and we still have to uh, pay attention and make sure that we, uh, we advocate and, uh, and inspire others uh, to, to do what we've done here in the state by getting your vaccination. I mean, that's the best way to protect ourselves right now. And it's within reach for every single American free of charge. Uh, get your vaccine. Greg, the Bennington banner. It's been taken. Thank you. My question has been taken. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Joseph Gresser, the Barton Chronicle. Joseph Gresser. Okay, we'll move to Julie from the Wall Street Journal. Hi, congratulations. Um, I'm just wondering if there's any lessons learned that you plan to apply to other ongoing public health crises in the future and to public health in general. Well, obviously, uh, we're uh, developing this playbook, and we want to make sure uh, that we uh, reflect on what we've done right, what we uh, could have done better, uh, and uh, start writing that playbook, because I'm sure in the future there'll be other opportunities to use what we've, we've learned uh, to be better prepared uh, and, and to, again, trust the science, the data, and, and maybe uh, we should all, you know, as a country, as a world, uh, invest more in, uh, in, in those health opportunities. And, and I think uh, Dr. Levine has talked about this in the past, where um, we have uh, not kept up the level of, uh, of protection uh, in terms of uh, the health care uh, world. So. Uh, I, I would say, you know, there's a lot of silver linings, uh, and 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 again, as a country, uh, we ha we have so much to be proud of, and and I give great credit to the uh, the previous administration uh, for uh, developing this uh, uh, Operation Warp Speed, where we are able to now have, in record time, uh, three uh, three uh, vaccines uh, that uh, are viable, and and so. I don't know as you can look back in history and see that. And, and, and again, it takes everyone working together to accomplish that. So 
Uh, Dr. Levine, anything you want to add to the? Yeah. Dr. Levine's all set. That's it? Congratulations. Thank you very much. All right. We'll see you all in less than 24 hours uh, for our next uh, press briefing. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll be able to address all your questions at that point. But again, congratulations, Vermont. Uh, you've done a great job. And uh, you should take a moment to, to savor this. And uh, thank you again.